Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, seventh uh, session of Open Flow Cytometry. I um, uh, hope you're having a wonderful morning, uh, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, this uh, Open Flow Cytometry is a joint venture between Memorial Sloan Kettering and um, the Francis Creek Institute. And today we're going to have um, a session on cell sorting um, part one. Um, so before we go along, just let me um, 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 give you some um, notes on, on how to um, interact with, with, um, with the speakers. Um, just for you to know, we have uh, a Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll be very happy to answer these questions. So just um, add those, those to the, to the Q&A uh, box. And, um, but if you have any comments um, or any suggestions or any technical difficulties, just uh, drop some um, notes on the, on the chat box. Um, so I should um, start by introducing myself. My name is Rui Gardner. Um, I'm the director of the Flow Cytometry Core Facility at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And um, I'll pass it on to uh, Derek Davis. Hi, uh, hi Rui. Yeah, my name is Derek Davis. I'm the uh, STP or Core Facility Training Lead at the Francis Crick Institute. But for many years, I've um, run a core flow cytometry facility. And Kathy is going to be our uh, operator today. Kathy. Yep. Thank you, Derek. Yep. My name is Kathy Daniels and I work with Rui Gardner uh, here at the Flow Cytometry Core facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I've uh, been with Rui for quite a few years now and we're definitely excited to keep going with education and get you guys all started with sorting today. Okay. So as, as we've done before in these, um, these webinars, it'll be a little bit of a mixture of a little bit of theory and then some practical, uh, some work as well. Hopefully that'll all go to plan. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So what we want to do is give you an idea of the principles of cell sorting. Many of you may already use a cell sorter, whether you operate it yourselves or somebody, somebody operates it for you. And today we're going to be using a Sony machine, the SH800, and a bit more about that a little bit later on. But as well as a theory, we're going to perform uh, a simple sort and show that the sorter does what it's supposed to do. And the way most of the sorters we're likely to come across in the flow cytometry world work is very much the same as the way this works. This is an inkjet printer. And you, know, you quite often don't need to know how an inkjet printer works. You press print on your computer, you walk to the printer and there's your page. But it works by the principle of electrostatic drop deflection. We form small droplets of ink, we give them a charge and they pass through an electrical field and are moved to whichever area of the paper, your red or your blue or your green or your black goes. Um, and you know, you don't even give it a second thought to you. The only problems you get is if you run out of ink or if you get a blocked nozzle, which are very similar problems that we get in flow cell sorters as well, which work on very much the same principle. So you're probably also aware that there are other ways of sorting cells, particularly magnetic beads, I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the max beads or the dynal beads and so on, which use a magnetically labeled antibody and a magnet. We're not, we're not doing that, we're using drop deflection. And we've seen from previous webinars that if we look at a heterogeneous population of cells under the microscope, they all look very similar, cells look very similar, but we know that they're very different at the molecular level. And in cytometry, we add fluorescence to identify those cells. So the more fluorochromes we add, the more specifically we can, um, we can identify the cell population that we're interested in. And cell sorting is simply taking that population and separating it from the other cells of interest or M&Ms of interest. In this case, I asked Kathy to give me the blue and the red ones separately. And that in effect is what we're doing on our cell sorter. Now, I thought right at the beginning, I would show an example of cell sorting because this, this is what we want, isn't it? We're interested in a particular population. So the three panels on the top here are our unsorted cells. The three panels on the bottom are our, are our sorted cells. So here we're defining live cells on the basis of a viability dye. In this case, it's propidium iodide. That's getting rid of our dead cells. Then within that live cell population, we're defining this double negative population. Doesn't matter what the markers are, but it's a APC-FITC double negative. Within that population, 
what we're interested in is this population here that's e floor 780 pe um, negative so e, e floor positive pe negative and at the end of our sort this is what we expect to get a pure population of live double negative e floor 780 positive cells and in an ideal world of course that's what would happen every time but getting to that point can be a little bit tricky there are a lot of things that we need to think about and we're going to try and give you a, an introduction to some of those today's today we, we are going to have another session on cell sorting in, in a month's time where we'll maybe go into a little bit more detail we'll try and give you the overview here today and as Rui said please, please feel free to ask as many questions as you have in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll try and answer them today so most of us are familiar with flow analyzers and we know no matter who we buy our flow analyzer from it will have the same basic components it'll have a fluidic system and that's there to take our cells through the machine to hydrodynamically focus them so that we make single cell measurements remember flow cytometry is a single cell technology we'll have one or generally more lasers to excite the fluorochromes that we've added to our cells or particles We'll have an optical system that allows us to separate light that we're interested in. So a series of long pass, short pass, band pass filters. And then we'll have an electronic system to capture that light, to quantitate it and to make it appear on our screen. And a cell sorter also has all of those components. It, it has to because you know, we're using flow cytometry to define the cells that we're interested in. It's just that it has an extra part. It has a sorting module. It, allows us to decide which cells we want to sort and a means of separating those from the cells that we don't want. So our target and our non-target cells. So as with anything in the lab, there are some pros and cons of all pieces of equipment. And in terms of flow sorting or electrostatic drop sorting, there are some quite big advantages. We get very pure populations of interest, you know, 99% positive uh, should be fairly easily achievable although as we'll see it does depend on the input the sample as well so sample preparation is even more crucial for cell sorting than it is for cell analysis we can sort the populations that we want to to sort on the basis of any number of fluorochromes as many as we can uh, detect on our cytometer so we can if you've got a five or ten or fifteen color Analysis, analysis experiment, we can simply take that to the cell sorter, assuming we have enough detectors on it, and sort on the basis of your multiple parameters. We can also sort populations of level of fluorescence. Now, that's something you can't really do with magnetic beads, for example. So we could sort bright GFPs from intermediate, from low, from negative GFPs. We can sort more than one population at once. Pretty much every cytometer, cell sorter, on the market will allow us to do two, most will do four, some will do six populations at once. And importantly, we can do single cell sorting. Now, obviously single cell sorting could be done by a graduate student doing limiting dilution. Um, but one of the growth industries we found in cell sorting in recent years has been single cell sorting for post sort genomics or proteomics or, or transcriptomics. And in those cases, it actually becomes quite crucial that we are only putting one cell in a well. There are some, of course, limitations. I hesitate to say downsides or, or cons. There are some limitations. Cell sorters tend to be a little bit more costly than analyzers because they have that extra module that allows us to sort. Often they'll require more expertise so many of you who, who take your cells to a core facility may have your sort done by a member of the core facility staff because they have that expertise and it sometimes depends on sort availability and what i mean by that is how far in advance you have to think about booking so in some of our sorters at the crick we have to think about maybe two to three weeks in advance before you can get uh, a booking time on a sorter or your favorite sorter and sometimes it can take a little bit of time to get the number of cells back that you want 
Now, this is going to depend on your downstream application. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a, in a little while. So these first three are things that manufacturers have tried to address in recent years. And I'll just put a slide here with a few examples of, um, of cell sorters out there. And the ones on the top here are probably what I would call high-end flow sorters. They're probably the ones that are going to be in a core facility and may require specialist expertise to run them. Although I would say I, we could probably train anybody to, to sort on one of these. It just may take a little bit more time than it takes you to, to run an analyzer. And then these on the bottom here are maybe the more walk up, more user friendly sorters that manufacturers have brought to market in, in recent years. In fact, the Beckman Coulter Cytoflex SRT hasn't actually really been, been launched yet. It's launched at the beginning of March. Um, and this is what we're going to be using today, the Sony SH800. Again, more of that in, in a little while. But all of these sorters work in the same way. They work by electrostatic drop deflection. And to do that, our analyzers are a closed system. Okay, we have a box of sheath fluid. We introduce our cells into that pressurized fluid. That fluid hydrodynamically focuses, takes our cells through our laser beams. We get information about the cells and then they're carried to a waste component, a waste pot. Now, if we want to get those cells back again, we have to open up that system. And the way we do that is by ejecting our cells into air in a column of sheath fluid. Now, all columns of fluid are unstable. Okay, take the hose here as an example. You can see there's a, a solid column of fluid coming out here. Uh, and then somewhere over here where it starts getting a bit fuzzy, that starts to break up into droplets. Now, the, the distance that those droplets start to form is dependent on several things. It's dependent on the water pressure that I've applied. It's dependent on the size of the orifice of my hose pipe. It's also dependent on things like the viscosity of the fluid, the temperature, and so on. Um, Derek, sorry to interrupt sorry. you. Yeah, so you, you, we do have, <clears throat> exactly, we do have actually a, a question from Anne. Um, she's asking, uh, do the cells need to be expressed fluorescence? Um, so do they need to express fluorescence uh, themselves or or do they have to have something attached to the surface um, before sorting? Okay, well, that, that's a good question. So yeah, we, we can sort cells on the basis of anything in effect. So we can use a, an expressed fluorescent protein, for example. We can use a fluorescent labeled antibody, which generally is on the surface of the cell, because if we if it's inside the cell, we're going to have to permeabilize our cells. And right. if you want to regrow them, that's not a good got a good plan. But sometimes you want to get them back for some other reason. Or we could even just use the scatter properties of our cells. And sometimes people just want to get a clonal population and they'll just use light scatter to do that. So virtually anything that we can do on an analytical flow cytometer, right. we can transfer across to to the, the, the sorter exactly as long we, as long as we can differentiate somehow right um we can sort them exactly we need to be able to see it to sort it exactly yeah. thank you so, so yeah our streams here are unstable they're going to break up into droplets and you'll know if you have a hose and you're watering your garden if you do this if you vibrate that hose what happens is the the break off stabilizes so we can stabilize that break off by applying a known vibration. So the number of times we move the hose per second and the amplitude, so the amount that we do it. And in essence, that's what we're doing on our flow sorter. So this is uh, one of Rui's highly animated slides. So we have to use this one. This is cell sorting in, in one slide or the, the overview of what's going to happen. We take our cells, we're going to inject them into a flow cell. At some point, they're going to go through one or more laser beams. And as they go through those laser beams, poof, we get fluorescence emitted, we get photons emitted, and we capture that. So we know the fluorescence characteristics of that cell as they pass through that point. That column of fluid that the cells in are in is going to be vibrated. We're going to bounce that nozzle up and down very quickly, anywhere between 10 and 100,000 times per second. And what that does is it stabilizes this this point where we start to form the drops, what we call the drop break-off. 
So as our cell passes down the stream, what we do is we wait until it's passed through the interrogation point. We wait until the point that it's just at the end of that column of fluid. So it's just as it's about to form a drop. And when it does, when it's at that point, we charge the stream. We apply an electrical current to the stream. So the whole stream is now charged and we keep charging that stream until the drop has been formed. Now at that point, we discharge the stream. Okay, so now the stream is back to neutral, but that drop, because now it's now it's detached, it's still carrying that charge, which can be, which can be positive or negative. That drop is now going to pass through these two high voltage deflection plates. There's an electrical field there, and it's going to be dragged off towards the plate of the opposite charge. So you can see by giving a positive and negative charge, we can sort one population to the right, one to the left. And by varying that charge, we could sort either two or three populations to the right or the left. And in essence, that's how a cell sorter works. Simple, right? And if we put a camera there, which we'll see in, in a moment live, we can see that solid column of fluid. You can see the undulations. So it started to drake, break up into droplets. And here is our drop break off. Okay, so once we get past that point, we have individual droplets. And this is the last point that we can actually interact with our fluid or our, our, our drop where our cell is going to be. So you know, a, a sort of sorts drops. The cells just happen to be in those drops and go along go along for the ride. So obviously it's not quite as simple as that. So we want to look at some of the things that are going to affect a successful cell sort. And one of those is the nozzle, the size of the, of the nozzle that we're going to use on a flow cytometer. We can vary that and, and we'll look at the reasons why we might want to vary that. Where we make our fluorescent measurements is different in different sorters. So it's, it's nice to have an overview of the way they work. We're going to look at how we produce the drops and how many we produce, because the more drops we can produce, the, the quicker we can source, but there are some constraints on that. We're going to look at how we calculate how long to wait from the interrogation point to the break-off point, because we want to make sure that we sort the cells that we want, because ultimately what we want is a pure populations of cells that we're interested in. What could go wrong? Well, we'll find out, won't we? So I said there, there are a couple of different ways that cell sorters are set up. And it really, the difference is where they make the measurements. So we have what we call cuvette-based systems. And these are very similar to the analyzers that we've looked at in previous uh, webinars. The measurement, i.e. where the cells go through the laser beam is in a quartz flow cell. Now that has a couple of advantages. It, it means that our detection lens can be quite close to the point of interrogation. So we don't lose very much light. And that makes the cuvette based systems maybe a, a slightly better option if we're looking for sensitivity. So if we have a, a fairly low signal to noise ratio, the uh, more light that we can, can collect, the hopefully the better that separation is. And it's only after the cells pass through the laser and pass through a nozzle that we form these drops. The other system we have is what we call a jet in air system. The difference here is we eject our cells through a nozzle before they go through the laser beam. So that has the advantage that it's slightly quicker. We can run our cells more quickly, but maybe sensitivity is a little bit reduced because the lens that we're collecting our light has to be a little bit further away from the interrogation point and we might lose a little bit more light. So there's, so there's also a difference in the speed that we put those cells in. Don't worry too much about that. But you know, in general terms, the cuvette space systems may give us a little bit greater sensitivity and the jet in air systems may allow us to look at cells more quickly. Now, I notice Rui has reappeared. So does that mean we have some questions that we need to answer, Rui? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, uh, there are a few questions here that are quite interesting. Um, so the first question from Adam Wright is, um, he's asking, did you say the nozzle vibrates 
um, and that's what the charge wire is doing to create the amplitude and frequency. I suppose the way it's um, the the the, the uh, charging is affecting the nozzle is slightly different in in the different systems. But yeah, there's a charging at the, at the top in both of these that is going to. Uh, it, it's an acoustic charging, so you're getting a crystal that's vibrating multiple times per second, and that's what's creating the the undulations on the on the column of fluid, which causes that to break up. And the two things that we're going to look at are the the frequency and the amplitude of that vibration, because that affects the number of drops that we exactly. produce per second and the stability of the break off. Right. So it's basically sending a sound wave through the stream and breaking it in, in droplets, right? Absolutely. Um, so the, the other question is, uh, do the cells get randomly charged um, or are or is there a mechanism based on cell surface properties? Okay, so first thing to say, your cells don't get charged at all. Yeah. It's the drop that gets charged. So the it's going to be the outside of the drop that gets charged. So that isn't going to affect um, your cells because by the time your cells end up in a waiting receptacle, that is going to have naturally discharged. So we'll see in a second how we actually work out which drops we do charge, but yeah, it, it shouldn't right. affect your cells. And another very important question um, that um, um, Alexander Neto is asking, how do you know for sure that the cells are separated from each other so they don't go through the laser regions at the same time? Okay, yeah, that is a very important question when we're thinking about what we can sort, and, and we'll come to that in a, in a little while, but one consideration is, yes, sometimes we have more than one cell in the laser beam at once, Sometimes we can separate those signals and, and we would remove them by the fact that they're doublets. Sometimes cells come very close together. Um, now with a cell sorter, if we have two cells close together, they're so close, sometimes we can't make a measurement of the, the second cell, or the second event, if you like, and that can impact on our purity. So in, in many sorters, what we would do is we would abort that measurement. It's what we call a hardware abort because we don't know what the following cell is so we don't want to impact or impinge on our purity. So that's one of the way we can lose cells, or exactly. lose cells that we could have sorted. Right. It's, quite a, it's quite a complex uh, um, consideration. I think uh, we'll, we'll yeah. come to it a little bit more later on. Exactly. Um, and then the next question is, how are the charges deposited on the droplets in a four-way sort? Okay, exactly the same way really as they are in a, in a one-way one sort. You're just varying the charge, so you will decide which way you want particular populations to go. And then the cytometer will say, right, I'm giving the, the biggest charge to this population that's going to the left. I'll give a slightly lower charge of the same um, charge that's going to, th to the left as well. And I do the same on the right hand side. Right. And uh, Adam is just um, uh, coming up with a follow up question. Um, so where is that piezoelectric crystal? So it's basically um, above the flow cell. So it'll be somewhere up here. It'll be slightly different on different um, cytometers, exactly. but it's, exactly. it's, it's up the so top it's there. Sending that sound wave through the through the stream. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. We'll carry on. Okay. So this is just some pictures uh, of those two. Um, so this is a fax aria, which we'll be using next time. This is a, a moflo. You can just maybe about see the stream of fluid coming through here. And this is examples of the nozzles we would use. So one other slight advantage of the cuvette based systems as well is it's very difficult to see, but here is where we're making measurements on our cell, the flow cell, and just below that is the nozzle. So on a cuvette based system, we're just taking a nozzle in and out. We're not really affecting the alignment of the lasers to the flow cell. Whereas in this, the stream in air, if I have to remove that nozzle and add another one, I'm going to have to realign my stream to my laser beams and possibly the, the height of that and also the collection lens behind here as well. And that's why things like the, the Astrios and the MoFlo XDP and the Influx machines that use this stream in air or analysis in air system are more difficult to teach people. We can still do it, but you, know, you have to align lasers. So that might be a consideration to you as well, which is why most of the walk-up sorters that we've shown just now tend to be a bit more like this takes away some of the things that you might have to do. This is much more fun if you're a professional cytometrist. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the SH800. Now it's quite difficult to actually show the machine. We're going to look at the software in a second when I hand over to Kathy. But this is the SH800. Here or here 
It's where our sample is going to go. It's going to be pressurized. Our cells are going to come through a nozzle, which is going to be up here somewhere. And there's a column of fluid, and which is going to be made into droplets. And here are our deflection plates. And down here will be our waiting receptacles. So I've mentioned nozzles already, and I'll come back to that a little bit later as well. But just to, to give you an idea of the configuration of the SH-800, because this obviously becomes important when we're thinking about um, the actual setup of the, the experiment. So it has four lasers. It has a violet, a blue, a yellow, green, and a red laser. And in this system, they're all collinear. Now, I'll come back to that on the next slide. And it allows you to detect six fluorescence channels plus scatter as well. So we can get our forward and our side scatter. And it's a cuvette based system, um, but it uses these chips here, uh, relatively disposable chips. Uh, the difference they, they have is the size of the orifice. So today we're going to be running with a 100 micron nozzle, but you can also get 70 and 130 as well. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about which you would use when in a little while. So this is the optical layout of the SH-800. So we're actually going to run a very simple experiment um, today. But I say you can do six colors. Now, it has four lasers, but I said they're all collinear. So what does that mean? What that means is that all four of those lasers hit the flow cell at exactly the same point. So a cell will pass through all those four lasers simultaneously. Now, that has some implications on our fluorochrome choice in our experimental design, because you know, we're, we're all used to the fact that we can't use FITC and Alexa 488 together on a traditional flow cytometer. But with this system, we couldn't also use PSI7 and APC PSI7 together. Now, on our previous um, webinars, we've used uh, a Fortessa where we have spatially separated lasers. So I can use these two together because my PSI7 goes through a yellow laser where it's optimally excited before it goes through a red laser where the APC PSI7 is optimally excited. But in this system, those two lasers are collinear. So in both cases here, I'm going to get fluorescence emitted from PSI7. So I wouldn't know whether it was PE attached to that PSI7 or APC attached to that PSI7. Similarly, it would be difficult to use Alexa 647 or APC with PE PSI5 because both Alexa 647 and PSI5 have the same emission wavelengths, but they have different excitation wavelengths. So it just means that we have to be a little bit more careful. The advantage is that there's no worry about working out what the laser delay is, which is something that you have to think about with spatially separated lasers. So I've gone on slightly longer than I was supposed to. So let me now hand over to Kathy at the SH800 and we'll have a quick look at software and QC. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Derek. And I will go ahead and I will start sharing. Okay. So um, one of the first things that we always have to do when we're at a cytometer, and especially when we're at, um, you know, when we're about to start a sort experiment is we have to make sure that the instrument is QC'd appropriately. So what we see here is when you first log into the software on the SH800, there's going to be a window that shows us that the opportunity or gives us the opportunity to scan a chip that we can use to carry out the QC. The nice thing about the Sony is that it is very automated. So it really helps us out um, in order to simplify the sort setup. Okay. So like Derek showed in some of the slides earlier, we have here a chip and it says Sony and it has the 100 micron chip size. So what we can do is we can go ahead and we can scan that chip in front of the actual computer that we're uh, works, the workstation that we're at with the Sony. And when we go ahead and when we scan that chip and come in, it recognizes it and it's gonna automatically tell us the information there. We verify that information. And at that point, it's gonna give us the option to actually physically exchange whatever chip is in the instrument that was last used for the chip that we'll be using today. 
So today, what we're gonna be using is the 100 micron chip. And what I want everyone to pay attention to and be careful of is the font that you're gonna see is reading uh, legibly. If you have the chip backwards, um, oh, I think I had it the wrong way before. <laughs> um, so you wanna make sure that when you're putting it in, you can read the 100 micron and it's facing you, okay? From that point, you can open the Sony SH-800. And I'm just gonna quiet the hood right here. And you take out the chip that's currently there and put the new chip in, okay? You always wanna be very careful as you're doing that. And I leave the door open once I scan the chip. And after we go ahead and put the chip in, what's gonna be, what's gonna happen is it's going to tell us what the, uh, what the settings are for the instrument. Okay. So once we click next, after we've exchanged the chip, it's gonna give us the option to choose which lasers we need to use for our experiment. My suggestion for everybody, when in doubt, leave them all on, okay? No matter what, you always need a 48 nanometer laser, as we've discussed in some previous uh, classes for open flow. The 48 is used for forward and side scatter, and that's typically the trigger laser that we use in our cytometry experiments. So we always wanna make sure at the default, that's always on, but it doesn't hurt to have all the lasers on, which is what we're doing here today. After those lasers are all set up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna confirm the filter configuration of the instrument. The filter configuration that we're going to be using today is the one that's named with 405 nanometer laser, okay? This is something that's very important because if you don't have the correct filter configuration in place, we're not gonna be able to detect the fluorochromes that you have in your experiment. So we're gonna keep going. Um, I'm gonna check here to make sure that this matches up um, on the software with what's in the instrument and I'm gonna click next. At that point, what happens at the instrument is we do a fluidics check, okay? Or the Sony does a fluidics check and we don't have to do all that much. But what we do have to do and what's very important is we have to make sure there's no air left in the cytometer. Any introduction of air to the cytometer is going to cause instabilities in the stream. And any instabilities in the stream will cause unstable droplets. And then we're not going to be able to successfully sort, okay? So what winds up happening as we're going through, is you can see, I'm just fast forwarding it a little bit, is that we need to check um, to make sure that we have the droplets that are appearing uh, with the sheath fluid. We're gonna make sure that the sample line is not blocked by ensuring that there's dripping from that sample line. And then once the option is available, what we're going to do is we're going to do a sheath filter debubble, okay? So in order for us to do the sheath filter debubble, we click on the sheath filter debubble option. And the first part of that sheath filter debubble is very automated. So once we start, we have to hit start again and it's gonna go through an automated process to start making sure that there's no air in that filter, okay? It is relatively quick, but as it's going through, you'll notice that there's going to be a next step that it comes to once you're all set with the automated part, okay? So essentially it automatically goes to this window where it tells us to actually go to the instrument and it tells us to open up the side panel and tap a sheath filter and open up that filter and bleed it until we see some sheath fluid coming out, okay? This is something that's really important for the SH-800. If you skip the sheath filter debubble step and you skip the manual bleed, oftentimes you will have instabilities in the stream itself and you won't be able to have a stable droplet formation, okay? so. Always make sure when you're turning on the instrument that you do carry out this sheath filter debubble, okay? So I did do this um, just a few minutes ago. So at the instrument, it is right here on this side back here. Unfortunately, we can't take the camera back there, but this gives you a nice visual representation of what you're gonna see 
at the instrument itself. Okay. Once that's done, you'll see it's telling you to make sure that the droplet is stable. And if we see that it's not fluctuating too much, we can hit next and we can continue on with our QC. Okay. It's going to keep going with its uh, fluidic check. And I did mention just a minute ago that we wanna make sure that the sheath is dripping from the sample line tip, which is going to be right here. If it's not dripping, that's indicative of a clog, and that is not going to be very beneficial for your sort or for your QC. Everyone's heard the word clog. It's a buildup of biological or other material that's in the lines that's gonna prevent you from running QC beads or cellular particles or whatever it is that you're looking to actually run through the cytometer. So we need to make sure that's clean. If you were to ever run into that circumstance, all you would need to do is run a sample line cleaning, which will run some bleach and then water through the unit. And it is very automated and it tells you what to do in the software, okay? We do not have to do that today. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip forward to our next step. And our next step is going to be um, to actually carry out the QC itself, okay? So once this completes its fluidics check, I'm gonna prepare Sony QC beads. These Sony QC beads, you're gonna see are nice and blue in color. If you ever notice um, that they're not blue, typically they've just settled and you give them a nice clip or vortex to resuspend them, okay? They come pre-diluted so they're at working concentration and you do not need to carry out any, um, any dilution there. Very important at this step, before you start the QC, you do need to make sure that there is no, or there are no collection uh, tube holders in the instrument. By collection tube holders, what I mean, these guys right here, or this guy right here, this guy right here, Anything that we would use in order to put our collection tubes, we can't have it in the sort chamber because it blocks some cameras and some visualization that the software uses in order to carry out QC. So we have to be very careful that we don't block that because then you're just gonna have to be frustrated and redo your QC and spend a little bit more time that you might not have, okay? So we make sure that that's clear and then once we make sure that's clear, we're able to go ahead and start the QC process, okay? So by clicking start, we're gonna skip forward. And the first step is going to be our chip alignment. As it's doing the chip alignment, what's happening is it's physically moving the chip in the Sony um, cell sorter to try and uh, optimize the alignment and we're, at that point, trying to get the brightest signal that's showing up by fluorescence, and there's going to be a high intensity and a low intensity population that come up. So you can see the actual droplets themselves are moving around, and that's because that chip itself is moving slightly in order to try and find the correct alignment. We're gonna go forward just a little bit, and you can see it's first gonna search in coarse mode to try and find the, uh, the correct alignment. Once it completes its course mode, you can see it goes to fine mode. And now it's trying to optimize and find the brightest signal with the tightest CVs, okay? The coefficient of variation, we want that to be nice and tight. And that's exactly what it's looking for right here, okay? So that's the first step of the auto calibration for it to go ahead and do that chip alignment so that we can make sure when we put our cells on, we get the expected fluorescence that we should um, see if all things are going right at the instrument, okay? The next thing that we're gonna see once the chip alignment is complete is we're gonna see the droplet calibration, okay? So to make it a little bit easier for you guys, like we're just going ahead and making sure that we see each step in a little bit of a faster way. And again, all of this is very automated, right? So it really helps us out. This droplet calibration, what, what's happening here that you're going to see, the droplet clock and the droplet drive are going to be adjusted. So that's the frequency and the amplitude, right, that's applied in order to generate the droplets and get the correct droplet formation, okay? 
Think about the frequency as the number of droplets that are generated every second. That's going to be adjusted and changed based on the pressure and the chip size that you're using, okay? So if you're working with a 130 micron chip, it's gonna be lower. If you're working with a 70 micron chip, it's gonna be higher. And that's why we have to run slower and, and we can run faster respectively based on the size of the chip or nozzle and also the pressure of the instrument, okay? So what's gonna happen at this step is it's gonna make sure that it's fine tuning the frequency and amplitude to try and get that optimized droplet formation. And then after that step, what's gonna wind up happening is it's gonna do its side stream calibration, okay? One of the really nice things about the Sony um, is that you don't have to align the collection tube uh, def uh, or the deflection for the collection tubes because the Sony is doing that for you, okay? You can sort into 1.5, into five, into 15 mil tubes, two ways on the instrument that we're currently on, the SH-800. And what the software is doing and what the instrument itself is doing is it's trying to make sure that we get the optimal alignment uh, or deflection that's going on there. And we're also trying to make sure that we minimize any fanning that you might see from that center stream to make sure that that's not gonna interfere with the sort, okay? So it's optimizing all of these settings to ensure we get this nice tight center stream with the correct deflection percentages so that when we go to sort multiple ways, we can be confident that that droplet that contains your cell of interest is making it into the tube itself, okay? Now on other instruments, you might have to manually align and manually check to make sure that the streams are making it into whatever the collection tube is you're looking to, uh, to sort into. The one exception here that we're not gonna do today is plate sorting because you would still have to make sure that the alignment of the plate holder is correct based on whether you're sorting 96 well or 384 well, whatever type of plate you're working with. And I want you to also be careful that if you're switching from a U bottom to a V bottom or different types of plates or different manufacturers, you need to make sure that you're calibrating specifically for your plate type for, type for alignment, okay? But we're not gonna have to deal with that today because we're just doing a sort into a five mil tube later on, okay? Now, the next step of the process is the sort delay calibration. So at this point, what's gonna happen is it's calibrating in order to make sure that we can get the correct drop charge delay. We need to ensure that the droplet that's going to be uh, broken off is charged, that the, the, the droplet that has our cell of interest is going to be charged so that it can make it into its final collection tube, right? So again, other instruments, there are automated ways to do this. There are manual ways to do this. On the Sony, it's going ahead and it's doing all of that for us so that we can make sure the instrument, the, the cells or the particles or the bead, whatever we're looking to uh, isolate out at the sorter, we're able to make sure that that's the one that makes its way into the collection tube, okay? So it's going ahead and it's doing all of that and it takes a little bit of time. You'll see I'm kind of, making this go a little bit quicker. And that's because the general QC time for the SH-800 uh, is roughly about 20 minutes or so, right? It could be a little bit less or um, depending on you know anything you might run into along the way, a little bit longer, right? But about 20 minutes is a fair assessment. So we're just kind of skipping through all the different steps here. And what winds up happening is once you get to the very end where it's done its chip alignment, it's done its droplet calibration, side stream calibration, and the sort delay, it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna tell us that the automatic calibration has completed successfully. And at that point, we can select okay. And we're good to go ahead and get started with our experimental setup. And that would bring us into the SH-800 software, okay? Derek, are there any uh, questions that we have at this point on QC or any of the things that have popped up? No, nothing so far. 
Okay. It's very clear to everybody. Okay, great. I like but, but I suppose that. One thing to point out is that not, not all sorters have as automated a startup as, as that. I mean, many of them have some automation, but some have quite a lot less. So those yes. sort of high-end <laughs> ones I talked about earlier. So. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the nice uh, aspects about the SH-800. It is somewhat set it and forget it. Once you get the QC going, you can kind of walk off to the bathroom or, or go, go grab a cup of coffee or something like that and come back and make sure everything's going smoothly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. There's a question here then, Kathy, about the lasers. So you said you don't have to switch them all on at once. So if, if they weren't all turned on at the beginning, can you now turn them on? Yes. That won't affect so the, the alignment? Yeah. Or so, with the alignment switches them all on anyway? Well, we have to, when, when you're talking about um, when you're doing the alignment, it actually does not turn all of them on to my understanding, right? But because it's not a collinear, or because it's not a spatially separated unit, it's optimizing that alignment for everything at once, right? So it doesn't matter which laser so it doesn't is on. Need them all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you need at least the, the, the blue the laser. Blue. The trigger laser, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can set up for the sort now, is that right? Yep, perfect. Excellent. Okay. Yep, so we're good to set up for the sort. And at the instrument now, the first thing that we're gonna do in the SH-800 software is we can rename the experiment, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this our open flow test, or not test, we're actually running, okay? And I'll just give it the date. So 0-12-20-21, and then from there, you have the option to sorry, name... Kathy, sorry, Kathy, can we, can we actually see that? Oh, I'm sorry. It's not that. sharing the screen, is it? Okay. Sorry about that. Let me do a new share. Thank you so much, Derek. How is that? Yes, that's it, I think. Okay, yeah. perfect. So all I did, I'll highlight it right here, is we went ahead um, and we named the experiment. So it's open flow 02, 02 12, uh, 21. You can fill out any of the information you need for your experiment. And also, um, if you have specific sample groups that you wanted to create, you can go ahead and, um, and name them and, and work from that there. You can see that you have the option to add sample groups, add tubes. Um, I prefer to do that in the, um, in the experiment itself, okay? For measurement set settings, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're selecting the correct, um, the correct settings. So for forward scatter, you have area, height, and width that are always going to be automatically selected. And then you have BSC. Some people might see this and it might um, kind of be a little bit confusing because you're not sure what exactly it is. It's called backscatter by Sony, but it's the same thing as side scatter, okay? So we also know from our previous classes that we need to ensure that height and width are selected in addition to area on forward and side scatter, or back scatter in this case, so that we can accurately pull out single cells or single beads from aggregates, okay? The next thing we need to do is we need to select the um, fluorescent detectors that we're using. We're going to use today the Fitzy channel because we have um, Fitzy that we're using to pull out our populations by. And we can go ahead and for our purposes today, it'll be perfectly fine if we uncheck everything else. And we're gonna leave log area for fluorescence, okay? Now here you'll see you also have the option to uncheck and disable certain lasers. I'm going to leave it all on because I don't mind that those other lasers are on, even though theoretically I only need the blue laser for forward and side scatter. And also the blue laser of 48 nanometer is what excites Fitzy. All we have left to do now is to create the experiment and that sets the experiment up here for us, okay? So once we have that all set up, we would be ready to continue on with our actual experiment, okay? So in the software itself, it's definitely very user-friendly and straightforward and what I like to do um, is I like to go ahead and make sure at first I have my detector and threshold settings open. Those detector and threshold settings that you're gonna see right here, 
tell us what our threshold is based off of, or our trigger channel, and that's going to be forward scatter. It gives us a value for that. And then it also tells us what our sensor gains are. I do this that once I start loading up my cells or my beads or whatever it is that I'm looking to run, I want to make sure that I have it there right away so that I could make adjustments very quickly. Okay. It automatically opens up for us one second. Um, all of these different windows, but before we get started with that, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I got a little bit uh, distracted over here. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to just do some brief overview of the software before we get started with the sort. Um, but as you can see, we have our scatter uh, forward and side scatter that gets started up. And we also have everything ready to go so that once we're ready to go ahead and get started with our sort. Um, we're, we're at that point where we're ready to go. Okay. So Okay, so shall I just uh, shall I take over the share for a second? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Gareth. Okay. Oops. So hopefully you you can you can all see that. So this is sort of a little bit of a recap, I suppose, of what Kathy has just uh, just shown us there. Um, our solid column of fluid here is coming out of the uh, out of the nozzle, and if we only see those drops when we apply the correct frequency and amplitude and, and cell sorting is, is one of those things that you, you really get attuned to the sorter. You, you, you can hear when things have changed slightly and you get used to seeing the shape of these drops. So this looks quite good to me because I'm getting nice symmetrical um, formation of those drops. We're getting reasonably spherical drops here. We do get these little satellite droplets in there, which is sort of caused by that, that sort of neck there. So, uh, rounding up but these will eventually catch up with uh, the drops in in front so that the frequency i mean kathy mentioned the frequency there that the number of times we're vibrating the nozzle to make those drops the more times we do it the more drops we're going to make but that frequency is going to be related to several things like our hose pipe okay it's going to be related to the pressure of our fluid and as we've seen that the higher pressure we apply the more drops i can make because you know there's a longer distance before the cells start breaking up into droplets so you know there's more bits i can chop that into but that is also related to the diameter of the nozzle the bigger the nozzle the fewer drops we can make per second and it's also related to the actual nozzle themselves again as kathy said you know air and bits of bits of dirt are a real enemy in a cell sorter and you can have two ostensibly 70 micron nozzles but they'll actually give you a different optimal frequency and amplitude. So you'd like to think, you know, I want to get my cells back as quickly as possible. Let's use as much pressure as I can and the smallest nozzle possible because that's the way I make the most number of drops. Yeah. Well, which, which is true, but it's not going to be good for your cells because the nozzle size you use is going to depend on your application. So if you're lucky enough to be doing something like chromosome sorting or looking at small particles, then you can get a 50 micron nozzle, which obviously produces very small drops and it produces them very quickly. But most of the time in cell sorting, we're going to be using one of these two, either a 70 or a 100, occasionally a slightly bigger 130. So if I've got small round cells that grow in suspension, lymphocytes, thymocytes, 70 micron nozzle is uh, pretty good for that. If I've got bigger cells, HeLa cells or fibroblasts or other cell lines, then I'm more likely to use a 100 micron nozzle. Now, this is sort of rough rule of thumb that we should be using a nozzle that's about five times the size of the cells that we're using. Now, you know, a HeLa cell might be 25 microns or something like that. So although you can pass it through a 100 micron nozzle, it's going to give you more chance of a clog, a blockage. And that really is not what we want in cell sorting. If we're lucky, if we get a blockage, we can be up and running again in five, 10 minutes. If we're unlucky, we might have to take our nozzle off, clean it by sonication, put it back on, realign the cytometer, clean it again and so on. It could take an hour or so. So we want to avoid clogging at all costs. So we need to make sure that we select the nozzle that's appropriate for our cells. And another thing to bear in mind is that the bigger the nozzle size, 
the longer it's going to take us to do the sorting because we're going to be producing fewer drops. A 70 micron nozzle, if we're running it at 60 PSI, and this is a, a big difference between sorters and analyzers, our analyzers are generally running at like five, six PSI. So sorters, in order to make lots of drops per second, we have to pressurize that sheath fluid to a much higher degree. Now, 60 PSI is two times the pressure you're putting in your car tires. But it means that we can make maybe 70,000 drops per second. The bigger the nozzle, fewer drops per second. So one of the important things, and one of the things that we were checking there with the QC, is what we call the drop charge delay, or, or the drop delay, sometimes people call it. But uh, probably more specifically, we should be saying drop charge delay, because we're. this is the important thing, isn't it? We're waiting from the interrogation point, whether that was in a cuvette or whether it's in air, and we're waiting to the point where we need to charge the stream, so as that last droplet is forming. And as we've seen from that software there, it's calculated in, in drop equivalents. We say that we've got a, a drop charge delay of 27 droplets, I think it said there. Now, because the cytometer knows the frequency we're making, uh, those drops, it can work out what that is in, in time. So it knows it has to wait you know, X microseconds before it charges the stream, and it knows it has to charge the stream for Y microseconds. And this is extremely important, probably the most important thing of cell sorting, because if we're incorrectly charging, we could be charging a droplet that either doesn't have our cell in it or has a cell that we don't want, which is definitely what we don't want. Now, one of, one of the things we have to think about a little bit more in cell sorting is, is maths, unfortunately. So those of you who are in Europe, it's nearly seven o'clock or nearly eight o'clock in the evening that on a Friday, you really don't want to be thinking about that. But, you know, we'd, we'd like to think that if I'm running my cells at 10,000 cells per second, they're going to be spread out very evenly. We'll get one every, uh, whatever that is, 10, 10 microseconds or something. So that each cell, each drop would only have one cell in it. But life isn't like that. And the cells are never, never randomly distributed in our stream. We'll have one cell, then very quickly we'll have another, then there'll be a big gap and maybe three come very closely together. So occasionally, you know, we, we would have a drop with one cell in, we might have a drop with two or three cells in. I have another one here with, with a couple of cells in. So then we have to think about how quickly we can actually run our cells through the cytometer. So let's take a simple example. If we're making drops at 60,000 per second, we might think, well, I can run my cells at 60,000 per second. I can make 60,000 measurements every second. I would have one cell every drop, right? Well, unfortunately not, because we're governed here by, by Poisson statistics. And in fact, Poisson statistics will tell you that the way they're going to be distributed is about a third of my drops would have no cells in, about a third would have one cell in, and about a third would have more than one cell in. And that's that's the situation we want to avoid. If I have this situation where I've got more than one cell in a drop, I can't really sort that, can I? Because especially if I was single cell sorting, it's, it's not one cell. So let's drop the speed a little bit. Let's go at 30,000 cells per second. So then I might expect one cell every two drops. Again, that's not quite true. Now, about 60% of my cells have nothing in, sorry, drops have nothing in. Still about a third of them have one cell. But now importantly, the ones that have more than one cell have started to go down. It's about seven or 8%. If I drop my speeds to now 15,000 per second, I'm getting very few, maybe two or 3% of my drops have more than one cell in. A lot more of them have no cells in, but I'm not too worried about that. This is what I'm worried about, the, the fact that I have drops with more than one cell in. And if I go down to 10,000, that gets even better. So we want to try and get a compromise because we want to try and sort as quickly as we can because sorting can be quite stressful for, for some cell types. So we want to get them in and out of the sorter as quickly as possible. But you know, we want to have some constraints. We want to try and get as many back as we can with as high purity as possible. So we would aim for this sort of situation about where we'd expect one cell every four drops. And what that means in practice is if we know what the frequency is, we would run our cells at about a quarter of that. So if I'm making, as we were here, was it 20,000 uh, drops per second, we probably wouldn't go much higher than 5,000. As with everything in, in cytometry, you can go faster than that if you want. You just need to be aware of the consequences of that. 
The other statistical thing that we need to think about is the fact that our cell here, we know where our cell was in the drop that's going to form. We know where it was at the point where it went through the laser, but it has to travel, of course, down the stream. And there's a chance that it won't actually be in the place we expect it to be when it gets to the bottom of that stream. And that will, that will have a Gaussian distribution. So most of the time, you know, it will be close to where we expect it to be. Sometimes it might have got a little bit faster and a little bit slower. And that really is dependent on your sample preparation as well. So that, that's an important consideration. So we have to think about that when we're deciding how to sort our drops. And we'll see this in practice in a second, but I just wanted to put a couple of slides in because we can change the way we sort cells depending on what we want. Now, most of you here, I'm sure, will want a pure population of the cells that you're interested in. And that's, that's what most people want. They want a purity source. They want to get in their sorted fraction. They want just cells they're interested in and not very many that they don't. So what that means is that we can lose some cells because I might have some drops that will have a cell that I'm interested in and maybe one or more that I'm not interested in. So I can't sort that if I want to get a pure population. This is what we call coincidence. Sometimes, however, you might have a situation where you've got a rare population and you really want to get all of those back, even if you sort a few that you don't want. And we can change the way that we sort cells on our sorters by going to this, this thing called the enrich mode. They have different names on different sorters. But in, in this case, we would always sort a cell of interest, no matter if it had another cell in the drop with it. And we mentioned earlier, we can use single cell sorting. And Cathy said that we can sort into plates on the SH800. And in those cases, we really want to make sure that when we say we're sorting one cell, we are sorting one cell. So we can have a much more stringent mode of sorting. We'll go into this a little bit more um, in our next session when we use the, the ARIA and the effects DIVA. But if you think about you know, two, two drops, uh, they're, obviously they're consecutive here, not next to each other. But if we have this situation, so I have one drop that has a cell that I'm interested in and one that has a cell I'm interested in and one that I don't. If I'm running in purity mode, I, because I want to keep my cells as pure as possible, I would sort that drop, but not that one because that would compromise my purity. Whereas if I had the same situation, but I now change my sort mode to enrich, it would actually sort both of those because it would sort this cell that we want even at the expense of purity. And if we're doing a single cell mode, we think about where the cell is in the drop. We would only sort it if it's dead in the middle. Okay, so we'd sort that, but not that one because there's the possibility that this cell may actually not be in the drop and then we'd sort an empty drop which could have, of course, cost implications if we're going for some downstream um, sort of uh, transcriptomics assay, for example. It's not as simple as that, and we'll go into it in more detail, as I say, next time. But so for today's experiment, we're going to do something fairly, fairly simple. Okay, we're going to just going to take some calibrite beads that we get from BD. We're sorry. going to take the negative and the positive beads, sorry, positive Fitzy beads, and we're going to try and sort those Fitzy positive beads. So. We can go back to Cathy and we can carry on from where we, we left off. Okay, that sounds good to me. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Thank you, Derek. I'll make sure I actually share the cell sorter software screen again. Okay. So we we have a, sort of before I go on mute, we have a hand raised there, so Giovanni. I don't know whether you've got a question that you want to put into, the best way to put that into, is into chat or into the Q&A. Yeah, and as we wait for Giovanni's question, I think, um, I'm, I, I wasn't sure if this got addressed earlier, I didn't hear it, but uh, Svetlana had asked her for some clarity. So the, the QC that was being um, fast forwarded earlier, that we did that for sake of time, but you cannot physically fast forward through any QC on the SH800. Um, so that's not something you typically do, but for purposes of education, we just went a little bit quicker than what is normal. Right, now okay. let me, Thank you, Kathy. Let, let me just um, also address here one of the, the questions that was um, uh, put out there. Um, somebody was asking about um, if we have any instruments that we prefer that works well in a biosafety cabinet, you know, in terms of safety function, ease of use, maintenance, repair. Anybody oh. want? <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were still going. Um, so there are multiple options, and I think it's all depending on application, right? So 
we currently in our facility have um, a majority of our areas in class one hoods. We have the Sony in the class two hood. So it's all about um, your application, what you're looking to do. There are more and more um, bench top sorters, but I've worked with everything from a smaller unit to a larger unit in a hood. I think you have to think about the applications for how many parameters and how many simultaneous populations you need to sort um, because the answer will change drastically based on that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that almost uh, perfectly. Yes, it's yeah. going to depend on your application, what sort of containment level you want, the size of the cytometer, the cytometer itself, because some of them you need to get in there and, and align. So we have two influx cytometers in hoods, which is actually quite a tricky thing. Yeah. Whereas I think with the SH800, because it's very accessible, it, it fits in a hood very easily. Yeah. Right. I, I, I would say, you know, mostly it's not even the question of the sorter. It's more the question of the biosafety cabinet, right? That, uh, <laughs> that if, if they're not, so for instance, we've tried to um, um, get custom built biosafety cabinets that allow uh, for us to open up the sorter inside the biosafety cabinet without having to take it out. Um, so that really, um, you know, makes it much easier to operate the instrument and to do, you know, small interventions in the instrument without having um, to really do, you know, much, uh, you know, taking out the instrument, etc. cetera. So, um, so yeah, but I think it's more about the biosafety cabinet than, than the actual sorter. Great. I think, I'm not sure if, um, if there's still a hand raised or not, but I, I don't see any questions. There is, um, but so, I can't see oh. the question. Okay, let's so we'll, see. We'll, we'll carry on. Okay, Kathy. yeah, maybe perfect. I'll jump Thank in you. if we get it. All right, thanks, Derek. All right, so now here we are um, at the SH800 cell sorter software, and I'm gonna do a quick review of the software itself, right? So like I mentioned um, a little bit earlier, was that when I open up uh, the experiment and once we get it all set up, what I like to do is have our detector and threshold settings ready to go. This way, when I load whatever it is I'm looking to, um, to analyze or sort, I have it ready to change our, uh, our gain settings, okay? Automatically, we have our forward and side scatter plot with a gate generated, our A gate, which you could also call your scatter gate if you wanna rename it. So you can always go ahead uh, and make sure, oops, not mean to do that. Uh, you can always um, rename gates and go through that process if you'd like, okay? So for today, what I need to do is I need to sort some calibrate beads like Derek had mentioned. And I have a tube of unstained beads that I'm gonna use as a control. So what I'm gonna do here in our active experiment that you're gonna see is I'm going to make sure that I right click and rename this tube so I have an understanding of what that tube is, so that when I go back to it later, um, I don't have to use my memory, which is not so good anymore, okay? I'm gonna now take my unstained beads, give them a vortex, and I'm gonna load it onto the sample loading station. And I'm gonna use these to just get an idea of where my cells are, okay? You'll see in the software, uh, we have a couple of different things on this left panel, or a couple of different options on this left panel. And I'll go through each and every one of those as we get started, okay? So I'm gonna leave the sample pressure, which can go anywhere from one to 10. At a little bit more of a midpoint, I'll start off at six, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started, okay? So once we get started, it's gonna load the sample up into the instrument. And there is a relatively long sample line uh, from the probe as uh, the tubing comes through before it gets uh, injected um, into, um, into the chip itself. So we need to give it a little bit of time. Typically what I've noticed is it's about 40 seconds or so before we start seeing sample come up. So I'm gonna keep an eye on this scatter um, profile that we see right here. And I was a little bit incorrect there. It was 35 seconds. But what I see now is I see um, the population of beads coming up and I see the event rate of 988 events per second or 1,000 events per second, okay? Now a question did come through that's gonna be very important to us as we're going through and we're setting, our, uh, set up, setting up our uh, instrument settings, okay? So the question that came through was how do we know how to concentrate our sample? Okay. 
So you can see right now that we're running um, at an event rate that's a little bit lower, 500, 1,000. It, it kind of oscillates a little bit. And we need to be very mindful of the number of droplets that are being generated every second, like Derek was mentioning to us before. So because we have about 28,000 um, droplets being generated every second, we're well within the range of our event rate of where we'd like to be. And Sony does have some nice guidelines for how fast you can run. When you're going to actually concentrate um, your sample before sorting, it's going to change depending on the nozzle size or the application that you're working with. So if you're working with a 70 micron chip, you can have your samples more concentrated. If you're working with 130, much, much lower, maybe about one to 5 million per mil as opposed to 20 million per mil. Okay. So what I can do uh, now is I can go ahead and I can adjust my forward scatter if I'd like. Maybe I wanna bring it up to five. And as I do that, I'm seeing real time, the changes of the scatter profile. I can hit restart and I can see the refreshed um, profile of these beads. I can bring it up if I'm not sure what that population is right there. And what you also see is that there's a, a point at which I don't see much right here, right? So anything below this first tick after zero, I'm not seeing. And that's because this threshold on forward scatter is set at five. If I set that threshold at one, you're gonna see that there's a lot more that's coming up in this bottom left-hand corner. And if I set that maybe to 0.5, there's even more that's coming up there. How you set your threshold is gonna be very important when you're setting up a sort because anything that's below that threshold is going to be ignored by the cytometer and therefore it can wind up in your sorted population. So when you're trying to decide how to set up your threshold as you're sorting, you need to be very mindful of the application that you're looking to work with. If you're just doing cell culture and if you have some small debris that winds up in your sort population, that's okay that you have a little bit of a higher threshold, right? If you're working with some type of um, sequencing application downstream, where it's very important that you don't have debris, dead cells, this and that, you have to have your threshold a bit lower. Can't have it so low that it's all noise, right? And you're running thousands of events per second that are noise, but you can't have it so high that you don't see any debris, okay? So I could go on for a while about that, but I will not. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And I'm gonna... Sorry, Kathy, can I just interrupt? Sure. Um, uh, um, so I'd just like to just add something there. Um, so, you know, like Derek was, was, was mentioning in terms of purity, if you're sorting for purity, the instrument needs to know what is a non-target cell to be able to avoid um, that non-target cell falling in the drop that's going to be sorted. So in that case, um, we need to set the thresholds uh, in a way that the machine can see everything that you don't want to be sorted um, or you don't want to be um, included as a contaminant. Um, so the instrument needs to see it to be able to, to abort that. Exactly. Right? So that's, that's a, a big difference between sorting yeah. and, um, and analysis. analysis. Um, and um, I believe Derek Davis was going to um, answer this question, but, um, uh, but we, can, we can all chip in also. Um, so somebody was, was, um, had a follow-up question. Since bacterial cells are very small and in the same area of noise or dead cells, what strategy do you recommend for setting the threshold? Well, I think that, that oh. does come back to what we've been saying already, isn't it? We, you need to be able to see what you're interested in. Um, so if you're looking at small things, I mean, scatter is probably not the best way to do that anyway. The optimal way to do that, you probably want to have some form of fluorescence that you could detect your uh, cells of interest or particles of interest above yeah. the background. Um, but, but in terms of the, the threshold, the same things will apply. I mean, everything that's below that threshold is not going to be seen by the sorter and is going to be sorted with your cells, which yeah. you might be able to get away with, as, as Cathy said, or you might not. It depends what your downstream application is. Yeah, and you also have to be very careful as well that you want to make sure that uh, if you're sorting very small particles, you need to work with very clean buffers from the sheath and also from the actual uh, resuspension buffer for the particles itself or the, you know, the, the material itself. The smaller you go, the higher the chance of there being um, actually particulates in whatever buffer you're working with that are of similar size that can be very confusing. 
So I typically tend to also suggest um, for people doing a little bit more in the way of small particle work, which I by, am by no way an expert in, because I don't really do it very much, but run buffer alone, right? Start seeing how many events you're seeing there. Start try to kind of setting it, set you're seeing events with just running buffer. And then you have an idea of where it is um, above that. And that, like, as Derek said, um, making sure they have some type of fluorescence that you can trigger off of as well. Right, especially if you're, I mean, if you're running a stool sample where you're trying to look at bacteria, um, you know, it's extremely important to have all that clean, like you mentioned, right, sheath yeah. and, and the whole system actually. Um, but then, you know, you're still going to uh, probably struggle a little bit in trying to um, uh, discriminate between uh, between cells and debris and dead cells. Yeah. So, so having fluorescence is really important. Yeah, yeah. as much as possible. And, so um, Wait, Sorry, I was going to say we have another question. Probably worth if we get the sort set up because yeah. once it's sorted, a bit of time to answer some questions. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I agree completely. So with that, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and start our next, uh, or go ahead and set up our next um, gate. So by left clicking on any of these parameters, we can go ahead and change what plot we're using, and our, or what parameter we're using. And I'm going to choose the polygon here, and each click is a node. And I'm just going to double click to close it. And I'm going to double click, and that will give me our singlet um, a population right here. Then we're going to go ahead and look at our sing second singlet gate. We prefer in our lab to do two singlet gates whenever we're doing cell sorting applications, because if you sort two cells, one positive, one negative, on accident, and they go into cell culture, then you have a 50-50 mix, right? And you're not gonna have a pure sort. Um, so here we have pretty good pure, um, single, single bead um, population because they are beads. They tend to not stick together too much. And I'm gonna double click there. And here, this is gonna be Fitzy, right? We're just gonna leave it for today and have it be Fitzy versus scatter. And I just chose the rectangular gate and this is gonna be my area of positive Fitzy. Now here in the software, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set um, the stop condition for recording to a gated event count, and we can set a value, right? So I can say, okay, I wanna make sure that within this second singlet gate, I'm recording at least 10,000 events, and then I can go ahead and record, okay? Now, some nice things as that's happening, if I go ahead this is a, an interesting spot for the Zoom taskbar to be right in my way. So I'm just gonna move that real quick. And uh, you'll see that it says the recording has been stopped by the meeting condition. I hit okay, but the sample is still running. There are ways that you can change um, what the sample stop condition is. And I'll do that for the next sample, which is our sort sample. But for now I can just go ahead and hit stop and that's gonna bring the sample down. And every time a sample comes down, what it's gonna do is it's gonna do a probe wash. So what you're gonna see, and I can close the threshold settings out now, you're gonna see right here that the droplets are looking a little weird. It's because we have a supply of, uh, of water that's coming through that's rinsing the probe. And it's going through um, at a very fast rate that can cause some of those um, little bit of oddities within the, um, the droplet, the droplet. Okay, and instability. And then it stabilizes. And what we're gonna see is we're gonna see this green drop stabilize at the point where it says, okay, it's ex exactly the point where we set it up at QC, you're good to proceed, okay? And that's what this control break off is right there. So that's just a nice visualization of that, of the droplets themselves. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and select next tube. Be mindful if you ever have a, a tube selected and you can't run because start is grayed out, just right click and make sure that that tube is assigned. This tube is assigned, which is why that's grayed out. But I learned very early on, be very frustrating unless you learn how to hit assign if you create multiple tubes. Okay. So this is gonna be our sort sample. And this one is going to be a mix of calibrite beads, which are Fitzy positive and Fitzy negative, okay? I'm gonna vortex these tubes, uh, this tube of beads, and I'm gonna put it on the sample loader. But what I'm gonna do first, before I start running in the software, is I'm gonna take my collection tube holder, and I'm going to put it in the sort chamber, okay? 
So I'm gonna push this door to open. And what you're gonna see, there are little notches in the bottom that we can use to align in the sort chamber where this needs to go. And I am going to get that in there, right like that. And now it doesn't really move very much, right? It stays in there pretty well. And I'm gonna take a poly, um, polypropylene tube and I'm gonna load it to the right collection. Close up that door. It gave me a warning that the collection area door was open. I'm gonna say, okay, I know that, right? Now, what I'm gonna do this time before I get started is I'm going to go ahead and load that collection. You can see where I did that right here. And I'm gonna choose what I'm going to wanna to use for sorting, okay? So you can see if I click on the method, we have different ways to sort. If I select two-way tube, I can sort into the 1.5, 5 or 15 mil Eppendorf. And you can get a little creative based on what you can fit in those um, orifices. And as far as the mode goes, what we're gonna choose today is ultra purity, which is one of the modes that, um, um, you know, one of the purity modes from the SH-800 software. There are quite a few modes that are um, kind of explained in detail in the manual, and I uh, encourage everyone to check that out. And remember, what we want to do is we want to sort our positive for Fitzy. So where it says to sort, I'm going to select D because that's the population of interest. And if I had a certain number I was looking to sort, I can type that value in here. Or if I leave it at zero, it's going to continuously sort and keep going and keep going, all right? So I'm gonna leave it at zero for now. We already have our uh, tube loaded and we have our collection tube on. And I, as I promised, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how we can stop it automatically. So if I, I'm gonna actually change this up a little bit. If I choose 100,000 here and my sample stop condition, if I change this to recording, what would happen is once I have 10,000 events recorded from gate C, it's gonna pop the sample off. If I choose sorting, regardless of how many I've recorded, if I sort 100,000 of that population D, it's gonna stop. If I do recording and sorting, both of those criteria need to be met before the sample will come off of the sample loading station, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select start and we have that sort sample that I'm looking to sort loaded. And what you'll see is based on what you have clicked, uh, selected in the software, if I have a plot selected, we have our plot tools. If I have a gate selected, this new gate tools option comes up. And if I click on the worksheet itself, you see I have worksheet tools. And here what we can also do is we can change in our worksheet tools how many events we're seeing in acquisition, right? So if I wanna look at 100,000, I can look at 100,000, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead. Now that I say that all of my gating is correct and I'm happy with it, maybe make a slight modification here on this second singlet gate. I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to say, I wanna auto record so that this way, if I select sort and record start, it automatically gets going to start sorting out this population of Fitzy positive calibrite beads. And it's also recording, so it's doing both, okay? Now, I just want everyone to keep in mind um, what we're seeing right here at the bottom right, or mid bottom right, it's telling us how much time has gone by, 20 seconds, how much time is remaining to get to that 100,000, and how many have been sorted so far, the sort rate, and the efficiency in addition to the abort count. So all that information that Derek was mentioning earlier is all right here. And with that, as we're sorting, I will pass it back along to Derek so he can give us a little bit more information on yeah. um, some more testing. But probably before we do that, Kathy, there's a couple of questions sure. coming. This first one's probably for you and Rui because you have the SH800 there. And have, sure. you, have you tried to sort extra, extracellular vesicles with this, with the SH800? It's an easy one, no. <laughs> can't give yeah, I can answer that time. also. Um, no, <laughs> no, we haven't. We, we, we haven't sorted that yet here. Yeah. Yet. 
No. Okay. All right. We'll come back to you with that one then. <laughs> and the other one is about um, plots for sorting. So do, do you recommend sorting cells on a dot plot or a histogram or which? I'm happy answering or Bree, it's up yeah, to you. No, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Cool. So um, what we see oftentimes is that you get a better resolution of populations oh, when you're looking. So I was just going to take the screen share back while you're talking, Kathy. Oh, sure. Of course. Go right ahead. Um, so what winds up happening is if you're trying to sort uh, on a univariate plot, you can have populations that are kind of very close to each other that are very hard to resolve. There are certain applications where people might want to see that uh, stereotypical histogram like in cell cycle. And sometimes we do sort on uh, histogram based on health, cell, cell cycle. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting snafu. Um, but for the most part, when we're looking at fluorescence positive, negative, or any uh, immunofluorescence data, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll use dot plots, and they are preferred. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So while, while the sort's going on, because sometimes it takes a little bit of a while to get through the sort, because we want to, to run a sort check at the end of it, just a, a couple of lines, I suppose, about thinking about how you're going to perform a successful sort. So I said earlier that having a good sample prep is probably much more important than it is in cell sorting than it, than it is even in analysis. And it's very important in analysis as well. So some of the things that we have to think about are you know, the size of our cell, because as we've seen, it will have influence the nozzle. We want to make sure that we use the correct size nozzle for the cell so that we can avoid clogging as far as possible. We might need to think about the, the cell type because as we've seen, we can on most of our cell sorters, uh, as, as opposed to our analyzers, we can change the pressure. So although today we're running a uh, 100 micron nozzle or whatever pressure it is, in many of our sorters, we could reduce that and that might be better for some cell types. Obviously, it would take longer to sort, but it does mean that we have a bit, bit of flexibility. We also need to think about our sample medium because we're pressurizing our fluid. Sometimes we get gases coming out of solution and that can alter the pH that's in our sample fluid. So making sure you've got some well buffered solution, heaps buffered solution can sometimes help. I normally recommend not having too much protein in your sample buffer as well, because that can also um, lead to, to clogging. And some people don't like having phenol red in the medium as well, because that, that does give you a little bit of background fluorescence. So it can affect our signal to noise. And our sheath fluid, remember we said in our analyzers, our sheath fluid can be almost anything in a sorter, it can't be. We can't run our sorter on water because one, it wouldn't charge. We need an ionized fluid. And two, it's going to end up in our sorted sample with our cells. So we need something that our cells are going to be happy with. Of course, for any flow experiment, analysis or sorting, we need to think about the fluorochromes we're going to use. Does Have we got the right optical filter selection? But importantly, we need to think about what we're looking for, the percentage of the target that we're looking for because that influences the cell number that we're going to bring and that influences how long we're going to need to book the sorter for. I said sometimes we wait a couple of weeks to book a cell sorter that's because with some experiments we have users that are booking the, the entire sorter sometimes more than one sorter for the whole day in order to get the number of cells back that they're interested in. Um, as we've seen we can collect into you know, almost anything you can engineer your own collection device if you like but you know, a variety of tubes and 96 and 384 well plates. And because we're sorting, we're producing droplets. We have those, that aerosol um, problem that we sort of touched on a few minutes ago. So we have to think about biosafety level as well and whether our sorters need to be in um, specific containment hoods. And we touched on threshold as well, and we've talked about this quite, quite a bit, which is quite quite useful. So, you know, we have to remember what's going into our tube. So in, in our drop, for example, is going to be the sheath fluid, whatever sheath fluid that is. Hopefully our cell of interest is going to be in there as well. But also we're going to be sorting any sample fluid that happens to be in that drop. So whatever was in that sample fluid as well is going to go through. And there may well be some stuff there that is going to be below the threshold. So as Kathy and Rue were explaining, that threshold is more important, much more important in cell sourcing because everything that's beneath the threshold, cytometer doesn't see, but of course it's still there. It's still going to be with your sorted cells and you have to decide whether that's important to you or not. So if you are going to some molecular biology 
uh, application if you've got maybe small fragments of DNA below the threshold, that can be a problem. So in a moment, we're going to go back to Cathy and what we're going to assess is the purity of our source. And that's, as I said earlier, is one of the things I suppose that what most people are going to be interested in. They want to get their GFP cells or their CD4, CD8 positive cells out of, uh, of the sorter. And we're normally are going to assess purity by taking our post sorted tube and simply rerunning it through the cell sorter. And if we do that here in this example, we sorted this double positive population. When we rerun it, that purity says, hey, I'm getting very old and I definitely can't see that. It says 91.5, okay? Which you might think, well, that's, that's not particularly pure, is it? But if I look at that population, it's only from that area of the plot, isn't it? I'm not seeing any of those single positives or any of those double negatives. And the, Sometimes we have to explain this to, to people in that, you know, that a cell that was very close to the edge of that gate may have been with inside that gate where we first ran it through the flow cytometer. Remember, if we rerun that cell, it has a, a Gaussian distribution of where it's going to be. So the next time we run it through, it may actually be the other side of that region. So, you know, I'm perfectly justified, I think, in, in saying, right, actually, this is the obvious population that we've sorted. Now let's look at that. And we're getting you know, 98, 99% purity. There are other reasons why that can move as well, which we probably haven't got time to go into today, but we will bring those back into the next session. So let's, I suppose, let's head back to uh, to Kathy and let's see how well the sorter has done its sorting. Sounds good to me. We'll go ahead. Oh, that was very silent. I thought everybody had gone. Oh, no. <laughs> no, not everyone has gone. All, all is good. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen again. Sorry about that delay. All right. So what wound up happening at the instrument itself is what I did is I did a couple of probe washes and I made sure that I ran some water uh, at a high flow rate to make sure I wasn't seeing any events coming through. If it was biological material, I'd probably run some bleach, rinse and water um, to make sure that everything um, was cleared out. But for the purposes of the beads for today and for sake of time, what I did was just make sure I ran some water, okay? So I'm gonna vortex that collection tube that I just sorted into. And I just want everyone to remember that I did sort into uh, polypropylene and not polystyrene. I created a post sort tube. So post sort, oh, I already renamed it that. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and get started. And we're just gonna see what it looks like and we're gonna see what our purity is, so. Let's, uh, let's see how the SH800 did today for sorting out these calibrate beads. Okay. All right. If I wanna try and get it to come through a little bit faster because they did get diluted out, right? I go ahead and I'm gonna uh, change that sample pressure to seven, a little bit higher, and restart that. And what we can see as we're going through is that the sort went pretty well, right? If everyone's seeing what I'm seeing, we're seeing that it's 100% um, of the population. And if you're looking at percent total, taking into account debris, taking into account aggregates, it's 99.3, right? And that number is changing a little bit. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start recording that. Um, but essentially we have a successful sort. There's plenty more that we could get into as far as you know applications in the software and, and kind of some tips and tricks and all of that. But I think we might be able to leave that for another day. Um, but what we've done today here is go through a successful sort on the SH800. Okay. Um, and you can see we have plenty of cells here, right? So I'm very confident we have, or not cells, beads. I'm very confident that this has worked very well here on the SH800. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select stop. And as far as I'm concerned, that's gone pretty well. And that was a little quick post sort purity check. Yeah, obviously doing a live cell sort is a little bit like working with children and animals, isn't it? It's never, <laughs> yeah. never quite sure where yes. it's gonna work. Okay. But, <laughs> but as, as, we see, as we've seen there, the purity of the, the beads, and obviously beads are nice small round particles. We would hope to get a very good purity with yeah. those. It can vary with the sample. And next time we'll do something that's a little more challenging maybe and we'll look at some of the other metrics that we can um that we can uh look at to see whether 
uh, uh, sorts have been successful or not. Sorry, I was just going to take the screen back there, Kathy. Yep, sounds good. Yep. So we've done our sort check. Um, so as I put in the chat, you know, if you've got any last questions, we're running slightly late as as we nearly always do. Um, so we have got one question there. Uh, so does the instrument make sort decisions based on light scatter as well as it does from fluorescent signals if the populations are well separated? Yes, so, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all of those things. And that's why we set the gates on all of those things, right? We're making sure we can pull out scatter profile that there's single particles or beads, and then also whatever fluorescence, or we don't have to work with fluorescence. Some people just sort based on scatter alone. I suppose because scatter is generally run in linear mode, there's maybe a little bit, sometimes a little bit more overlap between things, but if, if the populations are separate, we, yeah. can, we can do it well enough. You can, you can do peripheral blood on the basis of scatter. Yeah. As long as you can draw a gate, <laughs> yeah, exactly. on two separate populations that's fine yeah. okay good so i so said we we will come back to this next um next time so thanks everybody from for coming um hopefully you'll get a questionnaire after this i'm not sure if i've set that up but i will sort that out <laughs> um, because that's quite useful information for us obviously we've been doing quite a few of these over the past six seven months now and hopefully we're learning as we go along, just, uh, just as you are. Um, we're always looking to make improvements. This has been recorded and we will make a recording of this available on the OpenFlow Cytometry YouTube channel. So if you don't already know of that, if you just type in, uh, well, uh, there's the link, um, but if you type in OpenFlow Cytometry into YouTube, you'll find us and you can subscribe to that. So you'll get a, an email every time we put something up. So this should be up by the middle of next week, next week. And the next one of these will be in exactly four weeks time. So same date, the 12th of March, same time. And we will carry on with cell sorting. So we'll maybe look into a little bit more detail about the way we can change the sort modes and the way we can assess sorts and maybe talk a little bit more about some applications as well. And, and this time or next time, we'll be doing it using the fax ARIA. So those of you who attended the, uh, the earlier sessions when we were looking at Diva software, we'll be bringing some of that back in as well. And to register for that, you can go to the crick.ac.uk what's on page. So that registration is already open. And I'm sure some of you have already booked ahead. And we are always open for questions as well. So I'll leave that slide up there as we sign off. So you can email Rui or Kathy or myself. You can follow uh, the Crick Training Twitter feed and you can follow the Flow MSKCC Twitter feed as well for any important information coming up. Um, and, and other questions as well, you can contact us via the OpenFlow Gmail address. So I think we're done with the questions, which is good. We've done quite well with getting through those. So thanks everybody. Thanks you all for coming. Thanks Kathy and Rui as always. Yeah. And we will see you all in a month, hopefully. Thank so you so much, Derek. Thank you very much everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.